Hello, I'm Roberto, and we are learning Rust. Like every time you are with us, our host, um, super genius, Rust, uh, learner, uh, everything. And uh, if you don't know this channel, in this channel we talk about Rust and technologies. You can find the recording of previous stream on YouTube, and you're first watching us on YouTube. We stream every day, Monday, 6 p.m. Dublin time on Twitch. Almost Today, every Monday. Well, well, every Monday that you are not doing uh, talks around the world. Around the world, around... Okay. Um, <laughs> before we have an infringement of copyright, because how good I sing. What are we doing today? Today we detach from what we were doing uh, previously, and uh, we go to doing to do some uh, uh, advent of code. This uh, channel is born to do was born to do advent of code. So we are just uh, getting back to it. And it's Christmas uh, time. Have, so. Yeah, we have four exercise I'll get we can review all four of them okay what do you think Luciano mm -hmm. let's do it yes let's do it let's see if the screen share works okay and actually I want to get advent of God cool and you can see that we completed four of them or at least this is my account so shall we start with the first one yeah, let's start. Okay, with I'm just gonna skip. I'm just gonna skip all the nice stories. Uh, if you've never seen Advent of yeah. Code, it's coding challenges, but with a story. So you uh, you can read the story on your own. We're gonna just try to focus on the actual problem. So basically, in this particular one, one what we need to do is we have an input file. Which actually, let's start with that one. Let's start with the puzzle input. So basically is bunch of strings, one per line, and we need to make some sense out of them. And the idea is that for every string, there is some kind of number from the left and some kind of number from the right. So you can see here that there is a nine. This is the first number we find from the left. And then if we start looking from the right, the first number we find from the left, and then if we Sorry. start looking from the right, <laughs> so if we start looking from, from the right, at some point we should find another number. In this case, I believe it's nine again. So this will be, if you take the first number and the second number as digits, you get the value of this line is going to be 99. Let's do the same here. Actually, these examples maybe are not the best. Let's try to... No, let's go back to the readme. Yeah, let's go on this one. So this one, if you look from the left, is one. If you look from the right, is two. You need to take the left number and the right number and combine them together as two different digits. And the value you get in this case, 12, is the value for that particular line. If we look at this other one, the first number we find from the left is three. The first name we the first number we find from the from the right is eight. So three and eight, the value here is thirty-eight. And you can see here the first one is 12, the second one is 38. Then we have 15, 1, and 5. Then we have 77 because this guy, 7 is the first one from the left, but also the first one from the right. Does that make sense? Yeah, adding all of them together makes a number. And this is the solution from for the first part of the problem. Do we want to see the first part solution or we discuss the second part as well and then we see? Uh, let's show also the second part, then we show. Yeah, the because solution. this one is, I guess, that, that, yeah, part one and part two don't change dramatically the approach. It's just more involved yeah. how to get the numbers. So here it gets more complicated because the number itself from the left or from the right can also be spelled out as digits. So, sorry, not just as digit, but like with letters. So, for instance, here, it's true that we have a one, but if we read those first three letters, we see that there is written two. And if we read the last four letters, so imagine you are scanning from the right to the left, you find the nine. So, the, the two numbers here are actually two and nine. So, the value for this row is 29. And similarly, you can see here we have eight, and three, so this is 83. Yeah, the this... tricky part in the second line is that uh, a number can be part uh, 
a spelled number can be part of another spelled number. Like mm. eight, the two, the T of two and eight have a shared uh, letter. So my first approach that was wrong was, okay, mm. I take the, the row, I replace eight with an eight, two with a two and so on. Oh, I see, I see. And okay. that was obviously not working because... Uh, I didn't think of working. this approach, and maybe that's why I didn't realize about this edge case. Yeah, the edge case was tricky because uh, when you do that, uh, you are basically replacing the first one starting from the left. But if you have that eight two block on the right, mm -hmm. you must have uh, two. Instead, I was uh, having eight W O. Right. And uh, the first character from the right at that point was an eight and not a two. And uh, yeah. Oops, it was wrong. So, okay, they, they probably do that just to avoid you using string replace, right? And solving it this way. Yeah. Yeah, Tommaso there in the chat, a lot of Tommaso is saying that also a regex doesn't work for the same reason. I, for this reason, I think on Reddit they say that, that day one was quite tough to do. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, so this is basically the idea. We need to write a solution for that. And do you maybe want to show your one first, Roberto? Because I think oh, you want to sh you want to put me at shame uh, directly. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's. let's yeah, no, actually, I said that I'm not too confident about my solution. So. <laughs> and also, oh, I tried to do like a, an optimization straight away. So maybe I don't know. Your one is more straightforward. I have no idea. Mine is for sure simple. <laughs> don't worry. Okay. My last right. is very basic. So tell me Let's if the font switch. is big enough. And maybe do a plus one. Plus one from here. Looks and good to I me, but people in the chat, let us know if it's let still too small. Make this a little bit narrower, otherwise it, I don't fit the screen anymore. So um, a little bit of scaffolding. Uh, open the file, uh, read the file, get a vector of strings uh, from the file. So every line is uh, an entry of this vector. And mm -hmm. this is just uh, parsing uh, the, the input. Then uh, I have a function solve that does part one and part two, because in part one, I only take digits that are digits. In part two, I take uh, digits and spelled out numbers. So the difference okay. uh, is just a Boolean from how I call it. And then I print it uh, and so on. The test file only contains uh, test for part one and part two with my solutions, that are those two. Mm -hmm. Again, with solve, and we have in lib the solution itself. So let's start from solve, that is down here. Solve is taking, like we said, the lines and the boolean. So is for every line, I iter on top of line, I map, because from every line to get out of number, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then down here I sum it. Cool. Now, Perfect. how do I how do I get the two numbers that I need? By the way, spoiler: I did something very similar there, like very similar structure. I need a left. I need a right. Left mm -hmm. is okay. Starting from the left of the string, find map mm -hmm. a value with a function find that, that is defined up here. We we'll look at it later. In that line, starting from that uh, offset from the start of the line, with only digits or not, and unwrap. The same for right, but right is the same zero to length, but in reverse. So I think this is smart enough to not allocate the string, allocate the array of numbers and reverse it. I hope it's smart enough to start from len and go back to, to zero. I think uh, Rust is smart enough. Same. Yeah, I think I've um, I actually read an article about that where for certain types, for instance, in this case, a vector, because it's all allocated already, it can do that fairly easily. If it was an iterator where you are producing stuff on the fly, I don't think the rev function even exists because it's just a different Yeah, but here I'm reference. not reversing the vector. Yeah, I'm reversing on a range that I create from the length of the vector. Uh, or length of oh, the line, okay. sorry. Because the these work on the single line when we are inside the map. 
Side right. map, we have the single so line. You are reversing only a range uh, in uh, this is so, yeah. I didn't think that would work. I think I tried some time ago and it didn't work. But now it works. <laughs> maybe <laughs> I was doing something different. I don't know. I mean, it's a range, it's not the vector, it's a range of mm -hmm. 0 to n. Uh, so when I call a reverse, I, I suppose internally Rust is smart enough to just mm -hmm. keep the current pointer and decrement it. Yeah. I so um, I do the same for the right, then the number is left by 10 plus right, because the number mm -hmm. is always between uh, 0 and 9. I did exactly the same. Yeah, cool. So the, what is the find doing? The find is giving me an optionally 32 because it could be that he's not finding it but in reality he's always finding it because of our input but anyway i wanted to provide a, an mm -hmm. option he's defining an array of strings to numbers so one maps to one two maps to two but for simplicity also zero maps to zero one maps to one and so on so this way is easier um the going on max pointer is the length of my uh, of my line is the length mm -hmm. of my line a where am i here for all the digits ah yeah because here i get the line and a point where to start to look at in the line so I take all the digits that I can have, and I look if I have to pay to consider only the digits that are numbers or not. If I have to only consider numbers, I just skip the loop. Then I start, I, then I say, is this line starting at this pointer going on for the length of the spelled out number or the length of the string one, if it's the single figure, mm -hmm. equal to the single figure? equal to what, uh, whatever is the key. In that case, I found it and I return immediately because we have to take the first one that we match if we come from left or if we come from right. So I return it. If at the end of all this loop, uh, I found nothing, it means that uh, I found nothing. And uh, in this case, our find map is uh, uh, useful because we are uh, retar uh, this will return known a bunch of time if there is nothing mm -hmm. when the pointer is and go on with the pointer at one point that this i will match something it will return some v mm -hmm. and this find map will stop having found the the number and then i unwrap because uh, the input is correct so we always have at least one number from right from left so that's all for this test, for this, um, then if I run the tests. Yeah, find the map is a convenient function that I don't think I've used before this one. No, I I, start, I used it the first time in this test, in this uh, advent of code. Basically, I call the find until instead of getting knowns, I get some, and at that point uh, uh, it's working. Nice. Cool. Okay. Do you want to show yours? Yeah, I think I it's very it similar. Right. I think I only try to do an optimization, which maybe makes it more complicated, and I'm not sure it's worth it. But let's uh, let's review it together. So that's my code. Is it too small? I'm gonna do it one bigger. So let's see my part one. I have a bunch of tests. Wait, this yeah, this is exercise one. Um, Don't spoil the other ones. <laughs> so I have this function that is like parse line simple and parse line advanced. Parse line simple, what does it do? It basically checks left and right. Left is checking all the characters. And if a character is a digit, it just returns that. Mm, OK. From the right is the same thing, but I use a rev here. So it's basically 
exploring all the characters from the right to the left. And I'm using find map, so similar to what you did, but this is just for one character. So this is going to work only yeah. for solution one and not for solution two. And then I also do left multiply 10 plus right. Now, parse line advanced, I have abstracted some stuff here. I have like a much left and much right that we will see in a second. So all the complexity is there, but the code is pretty much the same. Just uses this custom code to do the same. Now, um, what am I doing here? The actual code for part one and part two is basically, yeah, this one is basically just scanning all the lines using the parse line symbol and summing them. Here is pretty much the same, except that I need to initialize this much left and much right objects, which is where I try to do an optimization. So let's see what all of that is about. Now, my idea was the following. I can create a, an hash map with the following values. So an O points to an array, which contains this table, and this table basically, the idea is basically saying, if you find an O, there, that might actually be a match. And the only thing that can match is if the following letters are N, E, and then the value will be one. Or for instance, if you find a T, that means, okay, if the following two letters are a W, O, that's a two. Or if the following four letters are H or E, E, that's a three. So I basically try to create a pre-computed set of possible things that could match so to try to optimize the access uh, into potential matches and skip everything else so basically what i'm doing in this match from left i'm creating this hash map and this is all the code that, that does that so it's a bit boring so we can ignore it and then the actual matching function does what i just explained so it goes on for every character starting from left and what it does is if the character is a number, like an actual digit, we can return it. That's that's pretty much what we were doing in part one. Uh, if um, SLN minus one, so this is basically, I think if we reach the end of the um, string, basically we didn't find anything, so the result is none. Otherwise, what I'm doing, I'm just continuing for every single character, I'm checking um if there is a matcher so if there is one of these entries here so it basically is gonna check for the current character is there an array right and if there is an array it iterates for over every single value of that array and it checks if there is a match and if there is returns that particular value does that make sense yeah Tommaso was saying in the chat that it is more like like uh, radix free yeah, I just generated oh, you... very dumbly manually. <laughs> yeah, you generated manually, and instead of having one character per node uh, with a termination node marked, you just have uh, any together in a single string. So mm -hmm. the first character that you match is through an hash map, the other one are a linear search. In the... Exactly. Yeah. And then uh, you, you could probably do like a tree and do it more yeah, fine grained where you deep dive but i wanted to keep it simple and, and when uh, you do that from the right how you do that from the right yeah that's where i'm not sure if you can um, there is a bit of duplication here and i'm not sure if you can remove the duplication probably yes but i'm not sure how and i didn't want to spend too much time on it so basically it's the same idea except that i'm creating a slightly different let's call it radix tree or mini radix tree whatever which is effectively indexing from the right. So if you are looking for a character, for instance, an E, this will be the last character in the in a potential match. So in this case, for instance, E might be a one, might be a three, might be a five, might be a nine, or an O might be a, just a two. Ah, okay, so or... you are doing uh, the same with the word mirrored. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, we also have Pepe Viola. Hey, how are you? Good to see you here, it's been a while. Okay, so um, 
so that's basically the same idea and the only difference in the matcher is that is going uh, is using this ends with rather than starts with and also on the string is using rev so it's almost the same code there are just slight differences like the way we build this in memory structure with all the pre-computed potential matches and then we, of course we need to go from right to left and then when we go from right, right to left we need to check if whatever is the remaining string that we haven't explored yet ends with the prefix that we have in our pre-computed map yeah we should compare these on the same machine to see the difference because my approach is very naive and very linear doing some replication mm -hmm. But the lookup in a Nash map for just seven, eight uh, entries uh, is probably killing <laughs> the machine. Yeah, I think you send me your repo, so I might pull it locally and we can do a test. But maybe let's just uh, test. Do you yeah, want to test this one remember. first? Hmm? Do we Sorry. want to benchmark this solution first? Yeah, go for it. Okay, so let me. I have to look if I add the, the cargo bench to my first solution. I don't remember it. If it's so, so see. this is year 2023, XSZ01, cargo bench. Now there might be a little bit of noise here because I'm also streaming from the same machine, but yes. let's see how it goes. Yeah, in fact, there is a regression from last time I ran it because I wasn't streaming <laughs> last time I ran it. Ah, you know how much the streaming is impacting. It's impacting quite a lot. But yeah, we are in the order of uh, nanoseconds. So let's do another thingy. What we want to do there is CD GH clone. This guy. Ooh. Why can't it? Isn't it GH clone? No, there is no command clone. How do you get a repo? GH repo. You can get clone, I think, is open the repo to the public. Yeah, I, I was sure you could do that. Okay. From GH? Mm. I don't use that. It's stuff. cool. Oh, it's GH repo clone. Okay. Repo clone. I have bad memory. And it's like a git clone, but it avoids you from having to, yeah, to write all the protocols and yeah, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Now we have advent of code, which is not yet this one. And this is your code. What do we have in here? Yeah. Uh, year 2023, then there is 2023 exercise one. Ooh, Python notebooks. Default. Yeah, there are also Jupyter's notebooks. And can we just do cargo bench? I think so, if I'm not... Uh, okay, obviously it has to compile, because why not? What I added, the different uh, criterion, probably, yeah, my version is different from yours? Maybe. Or maybe the cache is local to the project. I don't know if Cargo keeps like a shared cache. That's an interesting question. I don't know if anyone in the chat knows whether Cargo knows compiled crates from other folders in your system, from other projects, or if the cache is only local. It started, OK. And meanwhile, Tommaso doesn't like the idea of wrapping git commands. Okay, no, mine is slower, way slower. Maybe it's just my machine that right now is doing more stuff. No, no, it's just slower. It can't, one order of mag one magnitude is not randomness. Try to run yours again or run this again. No. Let's run the other one again. Incredibly, the naive approach is lower. Hmm. <laughs> well, well, because you are iterating well. over uh, yeah, your yeah, yeah, list yeah. of possible matches all the time. I think I am reducing yeah. that a lot. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
no, no. It's just my solution that is stupid. But well, it's working. I guess, I mean, it's not stupid because it the problem itself is not forcing you to find an op hyper optimized solution. So you just completed the day anyway, right? It doesn't have to be the most optimized. Honestly, I just wanted to yeah, try that and idea and I ended up doing it. Well, ni nice idea. And also is uh, the, my code is simpler, but slower. Yon mm -hmm. is a little bit more articulate, but, uh, but faster. So yeah, I mean, yeah. So Tomas is asking whether your solution is lower due to due to allocation. Uh, what I'm allocating, uh, I create a vector of strings. Uh, do you mean that allocation? Because after that, I just pass everything by reference. I don't, uh, I don't think I, uh, I create any other allocation after that. Yeah, my guess we didn't do any like flame chart or anything, but my guess would be that because what I'm doing here is basically in this matching function, I literally rather than iterating over uh, everything, every pos possible matches, I'm just saying, is there one of the potential matches that starts yeah. with the current letter? And I think this mm -hmm. reduces the amount of loops that you do for every character, which in your case, you just I, loop through everything. Something I could do instead of vector of strings, it could be a vector of reference to str and see if that makes a oh i see what Thomas means. right again i don't know why i cannot display today it's not working anymore it was working before anyway uh he said that i use iterator i think i saw somewhere in your code roberto let me put your screen on uh, i think i have to share it again because when you close the connection okay. my screen exploded you want to see again the solution from before, right? Yeah. I think you just use a collect somewhere, which probably has a cost because you are putting all the parts input in memory. This one. Uh, let me share your screen. Yeah, this one. Ooh, you don't necessarily need that, right? Yeah, I can make, I mean, uh, probably I could do a vector of uh, R, but even the vector, do, we, do I need the vector? Oh, no way, but in your benchmarks, what do you use? Let's see your benchmark code, because you're not running your main in the main benchmark, right? No, I'm parsing that outside of the, of the benchmark function. So I provide, so that is outside. So here I load the data. So the load of data is not impacting the performance. No, okay. but like you said, is that loop on top of all the possible characters that is uh, slowing mm -hmm. down? Yeah. Because then here I solve just, I black box the lines and I, solve, I just benchmark the solve itself. Yeah. And the solve itself is just iterating. Uh, so doing a first loop here, but here the, the second loop that instead in your case is a, a Nash map lookup. So to do the same here, I should convert digits to a lookup and uh, with the first letter like you did and a list of uh, arrays, like exactly the same. But then you also had to do the reverse of it to look from mm -hmm. the right. Instead, I only have this one because I go through all of them every time and the first one that match, I stop. Yeah, and your one is much more compact and easier to read. My one, it tries yeah. to be a bit optimized. Thankfully, it is a bit optimized because I wasn't even sure. But no, yeah, it is. maybe it, it is. wasn't needed to to go down the rabbit hole for the time. No, it's, ten times, it's ten times faster. So if you have a gigabyte of strings, <laughs> makes an impact. With the 100 lines, how many were here, it's not... Uh, no. Okay. A bunch of lines, but not in doing a big impact. Do we go to date you? Or yeah, people have, have questions in the oh, chat? Oh, no, sorry. We have to show before. Ba, 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 ba. Yeah, I'll let you explain this one. Big enough? I think so, yeah. OK. So use By the way, to... sorry, before you go into that one, if anyone has questions, drop them in the chat, and we can yeah. go back to, part two, to day one if you have specific questions. So um, part uh, day two is uh, 
the usual kind of uh, challenge they give you and the devs always challenge you with games at least mm-hmm. uh, three or four times per every other end of road so now the game is taking uh, uh, cubes out of a bag and every game uh, every round of the game it shows you a cube a bunch of cubes and then it asks you stuff on top of the cubes that uh, it was showing you so we have a list of games so game one it took out of the po- of the bag three blue cubes four red cubes the second round it took out one red two green and six blue and the last round it took out two greens and, and like this uh, game one game two game three game four game five uh, now the elf would like to see which games are possible or not with the rules that we only have 12 red cubes 13 green cubes and 14 blue cubes so if a game like this one takes out 20 red cubes this game is not possible because we don't have 20 games the red cubes we only have 12 so this game should be marked as uh, not possible mm-hmm. So in the example above, game one, two, and five should be possible, but game three is not because of the 20. And game four is also impossible because there are 15 blue cubes. Yes, here, 15 blue cubes, but we only have 14 blue cubes. So summing up all the idea of all the possible games, we have eight. By the way, the way I was imagining this game, even though that's not what they ask in this like what you need to calculate in your solution is like imagine if you had to guess how many cubes that were in a bag but you don't get to see all of them you just get to see a few rounds where only some of them are shown to you so that was the way that i was imagining this game and at some point it made sense but i needed to read it a few times to try to figure out what is the ask here and I, <laughs> for part and if, one if you look at the uh, input again I didn't even notice initially there is a semicolon. You mm. see that there is uh, sometimes a comma, sometimes a semicolon. Yeah. And that's very, a very important detail. The semicolon means that these are like rounds. Yes. And per every round, you can show different cubes and a different amount of cubes per every color. And I initially, I only thought that it was like one color at the time and it was all commas. Instead, you can have different colors in the same round of a game so it's important to differentiate commas and semicolons yeah because it splits the rounds yes so uh part two of this one instead uh, is asking again stuff on top of the cubes but it wants to know uh something different um what it wants a fewest number of cube of each color that could have been in the bag so this is doing more what you were thinking Mm-hmm. This one is saying, what is the fewest number of cubes of each color that we need in the bag to be able to play a game? So, for example, game three must have been played with at least 20 red, 13 green, and six blues. So, is the maximum number of each cube of each color seen through all the rounds of that game? Mm. So, see, we have to take blue. Okay, we have... Uh, one well, we did have nothing we have five and six so we need at least six cubes green we have eight 13 five so we need eight green cubes red we have 20 four and one so we need 20 red cubes the power of a set of cube is equal to the number of red green and blue multiplied together for example the power in game one up here is 48 the other one have other powers and adding up all the five powers of this example we have another number so first part is uh, tell me which games can be played with only this amount of cubes second part is finding the least amount of cubes needed to play the game Mm -hmm. and uh, multiply them together sum to get a number that can be submitted so my solution is uh, 
very ugly because of the day two I had to rush it because what was it Saturday? My wife wanted to go around, so I had to rush it out. <laughs> um, so the parser. Uh, let's go back to the main. What is the main? Did you did you use nom or did you just just do it yourself? No, I split it like crazy. Okay, cool. <laughs> so that's something you. we we can compare. Then. I split it like crazy. I told you I was rushing this out. So file, read, lines, vector, mm -hmm. games. I'm creating all the games out of the parser. So I'm parsing the games as a hash map of string to vector of vector of vector of vector. Of vector. <laughs> I will show you. So I created even a type. Everything is a vector of vector of vectors. And the string itself, I think, is the game ID that then it will be converted to an mm -hmm. integer later on. And this is the parsing. Then, so sorry, the is... outer vector is what a game games. Uh, now we go there. <laughs> Give me a second. <laughs> okay, game sets and then part one is the check limit, and part two is the least amount of cubes. Let's go to the parser. The parser is giving a vector of a vector of a vector of references to strings. <laughs> I kept everything as a string here when uh, splitting. Mm -hmm. So for every line of my vector of strings, I split on the column. So you have game two on the side and everything else on the right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then here I take out two pieces from this iterator because I have left and, and right basically, and I know that I only have two pieces. Because... You could have you split okay. once. Okay, I'm stupid. You see, but I rushed it, like you said. <laughs> I just went through. And but I just just because I remember before we started to use nom the previous year, we were mm -hmm. splitting yeah. like crazy all the time, but then yeah. we discovered split <laughs> once, which makes it very easy because you get left and right straight away. And then I forgot about it again. <laughs> <laughs> then I split again to get uh, uh, the game ID and I discard the word game itself. And I don't mm -hmm. remember why I joined. Ah, because this is a slice and I wanted a string out of it. So I joined uh, on top. I joined a list of one element to convert it back to a string. Mm -hmm. Even allocating like crazy. I told you I was rushing this. Then I split the rounds into on top of the semicolon. I split yep. the rounds. So now I have a vector of strings. And I split the single round in on the comma. I remove the and inside the single, uh, and inside that, I have a tuple of number and red, or number and blue, and or number and green. So mm -hmm. I split again on top of the white space. So the first, the inner vector is a vector of two with a number and the and the, the color of the cube. Then is inside a vector that is uh, all the cubes in the round. That is inside of a vector that is all the rounds. Okay. Okay. And then when I have all of this, I insert that in my hash map with the game ID and the list of rounds, basically. The colors don't have any predefined order, right? They can be... No, they, I don't... I, I gave the, or the colors for not defined. I mean, probably... No, they come in any order. So blue yeah, and okay. red, then red yeah, and sometimes... green, then... Mm -hmm. uh, red, green, and blue, blue and red, green. So you can't rely on the position. So I had to keep also the string representing the name itself. So for you, green is, for instance, is the value of that string reference, right? Yes. Green, green is blue, uh, yeah. in the inner vector, the smallest one inside. On the left, there is the number as string, and on the right, there is the color as a string again. So having this ugly data structure. But how do you keep the number together with the color? Because they are inside the same vector of two, the last vector of the vector jump. So this vector is made of two elements, count and color. Oh, okay. Why didn't you do a the, tuple? 
Uh, again, because I was late. <laughs> cool, makes sense. This but I, I, I was thinking, like, why did you start the number as a as a string? It didn't make too much sense. Yeah, because here when I split the, yeah, I probably if I annotate this as a tuple, I can collect into that probably. But mm -hmm. I just went with all vectors. Okay, fair enough. Then I put it that inside the the game container, and everything is done. Now, my check limit is uh, taking a value uh, because here we have to sum all the IDs of all the games that are possible. So red mm -hmm. is my return value. The limits are 12 red, 13 green, and 14 blue. Probably there is a smarter way than this to have a Nash map starting from an array, but uh, it's working. Or I could the, the, or I, I could have created a new hash map and then with free insert, 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 I could have inserted the free voices. But uh, mm. I copy and pasted some Python code and I already had this structure basically just ready to, to copy and paste. So I go through all the games. The game is valid until you don't say me that is not. Mm -hmm. So I take each round of the game and I take each cube is, is each cube pair of the game. <clears throat> I check that it's made of two elements. I mean, it's not needed, but because the input was uh, always uh, correct, but uh, let's check mm -hmm. it anyway. Why not? The count is the first element and the cube type is the second element. Then I say, okay, give me what is the limit for this cube type from this uh, limits uh, hash map. Yeah. If the count parsed as an e32 with a default of zero is greater than the limit, then the, the game is invalid and I break. Otherwise. Which, yeah, which basically means if you are showing me more cubes than the one that we know exists in total, this game is Yeah, this, this game is done. Is not valid break. Then I had to add this also to break the outer loop on top of the rounds because this break was breaking the loop on top of the cubes for that round. Mm -hmm. But uh, I can break uh, even if I found one round that was not playable, right? I think so. And I think and there so... is a way to break from outer loops. I think okay. you can say break two or something like that. space two. I tried, I tried that, but it was not working. Oh, maybe you need to put a label. I don't remember exactly what this. There is a way to do it for sure. We yeah, yeah, but, but... yeah, but fine. It's not the tiny. Also, and another again... quick comment before you continue. If you scroll up again, Tomas has suggested that you are using cloned line thirty nine. Ah, I can think you, you can just do into either there and into either. Either into either. And I think that should be the same thing, except you are consuming the the, the, the list you have there anyway, that you're not going to be using it anyway. No. So you're just moving it yeah. into the ash map. Okay, but cool. Thank you. And at the end, if the game is valid, I sum his ID parsed again. Also, why I'm using U32 and not U32 again, uh, rushing it out. Mm -hmm. And I have my final result mm -hmm. that is working. Then part two instead is counting the least amount of... Uh... Let's change this already. Because copy and paste again. <laughs> Here I have to look instead in part two for the least amount of cubes that are needed to play that game. So I mm -hmm. start again with a return value. So why I put a G, not just another, probably this was a typo, I typed something. So for each game, I'm using this later on. I think you put the underscore because you're not using it. Yeah, I put the underscore, then I, I ate the keyboard with a G just because it was probably a typo. So I iter again on top of the games. I don't care about the IDs anymore because mm -hmm. I, we need to multiply the number of cubes to have the power. So I do my loop. 
For this game, I initialize an empty hash map with red zero, green zero, and blue zero. For every round, for every cube in that round, I get out of the cube, I decompose with this letter that is different from the stuff I did before. And I was knowing, uh, I, this was new to me, the fact that you can say vector as a slice and decompose it like this. Uh, first time doing that. That was a suggestion, I think, from uh, uh, Rust Analyzer, if I'm not wrong. Mm -hmm. Then I count, uh, I take the count, and I store the count in the value of uh, uh, let sum get, yes. So for, for red, I take the number that I have and I say, make it the, the, the what it was before or count if count is greater than value. So mm -hmm. at every round, if red was zero and now I have five red, I need at least five red. And the cube can be green. So for green, seven was zero. Now seven is the new number. And when I go to the next round, if red was higher or green was higher or blue was higher, the new maximum value will go just go up and up. Once I did all of this for the game, in my list uh, hash map, I have the three cubes with the maximum value of cubes that I need. I take the values, I do the product, and this is my power. Then I sum the power of this game to the total uh, power of uh, all the input, and I return it. That is the approach that I took. It should still work, I hope. I I did, don't even wrote tests for this, because it was a day that I had no time, so I just mm -hmm. uh, went down to the solution. Okay. I think it's very similar to my one, except I maybe made it a little bit nicer with specific yeah. structs <laughs> and uh, using NOM for parsing. But then I think logically it's exactly the same approach. So let's see the NOM approach compared to this uh, mess. All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the first difference is that I use NOM for parsing. So we had a dedicated video about using NOM. So you might check that out on our YouTube channel. But the idea is that you write parsers for, I guess, smaller parts of your string, and then you can combine them together into like a mega parser that process everything. In my case, the mega parser is line by line. So it's parsing a game. But what are the, all the different components of a game? There is the ID part. So it's basically looking for game and a space. And then whatever is remaining, it tries to read it as a user to do. Then the next bit is how do you parse a color? And a color could be either red, green, or blue. So Alt basically says, try to parse either an exact match of red or green or blue. And then I also create a struct called color, which is basically only an enum red, green, or blue. So it creates that variant from whatever is the string. Then I have parse cubes, which is basically the number and the color. So it's trying to read a number first, then it looks for a space. And then it parses the color, so it's basically reusing this one. Then there is parse cube set, which is a round in the game. So is uh, trying to read a separated list. So this is basically iterating over our parser. Actually, is iterating over using a separator, and the separator is effectively a comma and a space. And using this function called parse cubes, which is the one we defined before for every value, and it gives us back a vector of cubes. Then what I'm doing, I'm saying, okay, the current values of red, green, and blue are zero. And then I do a loop and I do a match and basically say, add whatever is the value to red, green, uh, and blue. And then I just create the cube set. Now, maybe this can be done a little bit nicer now that I'm thinking about that. But yeah, for now it works. It's and... already nicer than mine, so cool. 
Yeah, I guess I could have done a cube set from a vector of cubes and then just do an into, but whatever. Uh, parse line is basically parsing an entire game. In fact, it gives us a game here. And what is it doing is it gets the game ID first, then it looks for the separator uh, column and space. Then it gets all the sets by using that parse cube set and a separated list. And this time the separator is the semicolon. And I'm also using this complete thing, which I just discovered recently, Mm -hmm. which makes sure that there is nothing else left in the line. So after it finished to do all of this, if there is still something on that line or on that string, it's going to fail saying, well, you told me that this would be the last thing I would find. There is something else left over. So probably there is something wrong with the parts. So it's just an extra safety net that you can put. So the that the input uh, should always be empty, the input on the left. Exactly. After a complete, uh, if, it's not in, if it's not empty, it's uh, erroring. Exactly. So that should be the idea. So this is not strictly needed because we know the input is generally correct. Yeah. But it was something nice I discovered and I just wanted to use it to try. So that's all the parsing. And basically in my game, sorry, my implementation of the game, what I do is I go for every line. I do a filter map. This is the part one. So where we are trying to figure out is this game valid? Yes or no and sum the IDs of all the valid ones. So what we are doing is we pass the line, which gives us a game, right? So at this point we have a game and inside that game, actually I didn't mention that game as a struct, as a game ID and sets, and sets is a vector of cube sets. So again, I'm still doing vector of vectors of vectors, just there is a little bit more structure around them. Yeah, you, ju you just have names for the vectors exactly. instead of remembering what's inside. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So what I'm doing here, I'm checking for... Uh, so this is a filter map. So I'm checking in these sets, if there is a red that is bigger than 12 or a green that is bigger than 13 or a blue that is bigger than 14, return on because this is not valid. So it means filter out this particular game otherwise keep the game then at the end of this i have a so the iterator is just emitting valid games so i can map again and just say game id now to be fair i could have just put game id here now that i'm thinking about that and remove all of this entirely and i think that should be exactly the same and i avoid an extra map and then i just sum the values Does that make yeah, sense? Okay. Yes. Cool. Then uh, part two is basically. Oh yeah, this is this is a bit more interesting. We need to look at the implementation of the game. So I did in the game. Where is it? Where is game? There is game there. Oh, there I collapsed it. So uh, minimum in, set. Uh, in game, I created this idea of minimum set. So a game has sets. And basically, I'm trying to figure out the minimum set, which is finding the max exactly as you did for every single color. So I'm doing max red, max green, max blue. And then for every set, check what is the value of red. And if it's bigger, replace it. Same for green, same for blue. And then at the end, I just return a cube set with max red, max green, and max blue. So this cube set doesn't really exist in the game because these values might be taken from different yeah. uh, sets in the game, but it's a nice struct to represent the maximum value. So I just reused it. And I have another method somewhere in cube set. There you go. Called power, which is just multiplying the three of them. So what I do here in part two is actually very simple at this point. I just say, parse all the games, get the minimum set for every game, and, and return the power, the power, and then sum, sum them together. together. Yeah, so because that, you put the, all the logic outside. So that was very simple. Do you think we have time to go through day three? Or I have time, time if you have time. Let's do it. So I'll let you do that one, though. 
So, what is Advent of Gold here? Day three. Day three. Gear radio. Oh, this one. This was was nice. Oh yeah, this one was interesting. So you arrive to a gondola lift. You have to go up the in the sky, and the engine is broken. And the engine schematic is this. Uh, our input obviously is big. What you have, you have numbers in the middle of spaces represented by dots, and then you have other characters that are not dots that uh, represent uh, something, some uh, symbol that represent uh, some uh, component of this engine. So part one is asking you to find the two numbers that are not part because they are not adjacent to a symbol. So if there are two numbers that are not touching a symbol, those two numbers for example, this one that doesn't have any symbol, this one watch out as the symbol touching it because even the diagonal one is uh, uh, counting. But this one is not surrounded by any symbol. So this is a lone number up there. And the other lone number is this one down here because again, there is no symbol around mm -hmm. it. Yeah, another example, just because I think here in our video, we are covering part of that example. If oh, you look sorry. at 755, there is an asterisk there, which is just diagonally below. So that means that that 755 is relevant. Yeah. So yes, sorry, yeah, it was hidden a little bit. So, uh, Cool, give me what is the sum of all the part number in the engine schematic. So you have to take only the numbers that are near a symbol and exclude the one that are not near a symbol and sum them together. And the sum is uh, whatever. Our input uh, is down here, I think, and the input is uh, a little Massive. bit bigger. Yeah. Yeah. So, Part two of this one instead is different. You need to compute the gear ratio. That is, you have to find all the stars in the schema. All the stars that have only two numbers that are touching the star and multiply those two numbers together. Mm -hmm. Which is funny because I imagine like it's an actual gear that connects two components. Yeah. Then you have to sum together all the gear ratio of this uh, schematic. But you have to only take in account the one that have two mm -hmm. numbers touching. At the beginning, I was also taking in account the one with three or the one with one. And mm -hmm. uh, that is not uh, going to work. So I had to exclude the one with one and exclude the one with three. That is an edge case that obviously is not present in the readme input because like always they give you readme inputs that are not covering all the possible edge cases but mm -hmm. let's start summing all the numbers that touch a symbol so which one is this this one okay again read the input vector of strings part one part two let's go to part one here this time i created some uh, types there is the type number and the type uh, symbol. Number is which, sorry, which number, where, and how wide is the number. So I have the coordinates of the last, at the right of the last character of the number. And then I have the, the width of the number, basically, mm -hmm. to be able to compute the square around it, because I need to know how wide it is to compute around it okay for did symbol, exactly it's the same so it's gonna be easy to compare that part for symbol is easy because symbol is always wide one so i just have the x and y and i have a string because i could have a char here but for some reason i made a string because i was thinking of something else probably mm -hmm. then i have a parser. The parser is not extremely complicated i have a 
vector of numbers and a vector of symbols that I will return here. And I take my reference to a vector of strings. I have my accumulator number that is an empty string. That is mm -hmm. where I put all the characters that are digit. And when I'm out of it, I convert it to an integer. So I loop through all the rows with y that is my y coordinate. I loop through all the character of the row with x that is my x coordinate. If the cell is a digit, then I add the I add it to my number accumulator that is a string, pushing the new character in. If it's not a number, it means that it's or a space or a, a symbol. In any case, if the accumulator is not empty, so if I'm coming from a number. Mm -hmm. I push the number in my number vector, so the, uh, the accumulator parts as an integer, unwrapping, because there are only numbers in that uh, string. I know it, because if it's not a number, I'm not adding it to the string. With x and y, and the size of my accumulator, that is the width of the string. And then I clear back the string to be empty, because I... I accumulated all the numbers, all the digits in the string, and I pushed it back to clean. If uh, here I'm, it's not a digit. If it's not a digit and it's also not a dot, it means that it's a symbol. And here mm -hmm. is a symbol. I just push the symbol into the uh, vector. I did Out it exactly the, the same. I just used a match there. Ah, OK. At the, end like of the, it, the whole uh, logic is the same. Like I, I use the same approach, like character by character, accumulating. And then when you see something that doesn't match, you need to figure it out. OK, did I just finish a number? Let's parse it and let's store it. You have to remember to push the accumulator into the array of numbers if you are at the end of the row, but there is mm -hmm. no other symbol on the right. So the accumulator is still empty after you cycle it through the row. And uh, you have to uh, put in the accumulator and clear it for the next row. And then you go on uh, because the accumulator is outside of all the rows. So, so you have mm -hmm. to remember to, to clear it every time you push that to the numbers. Then you return the numbers and the symbols. Cool. Here we go to this later. This is the, this is the function that gives you the list of uh, the other sent coordinates to check for symbols. But then part one, parse the lines, give me only the uh, coordinates of the symbols, because in part one, we want all the numbers that are touching a symbol, any symbol. So I don't care about which symbol I mm -hmm. am. So I take a Nash set, so it's faster to look into, starting from uh, the value X and Y of the symbols. So symbol cipher map give me only out x and y collect so here i have a nash set of u size u size perfect it is yep. x and y my retard value so my accumulator for the sum is zero for all the numbers in number if the in the coordinates are uh, near uh, that are touching the number so you have to pass x y and the width of the number any of this coordinate is contained into the symbol uh, values in this hash set. If any of this is touching uh, a symbol, sum the number and return it. What is doing this adjacent coordinates function is taking x, y, and the width. Oh, nice. So, so my coordinates are a vector. I have to push in the vector. The one on the left, that is x mean length plus one. And here I'm using saturating sub because a U size can't go negative. So if mm -hmm. it tries to go negative, it's depth zero. But it's fine because it means that it's still inside the number. And obviously, if it's a number, it's not a symbol. And it is fine. So I say, give me the coordinate on my left. Give me the coordinate on my right. And then give me the coordinate starting from one lefter to where I am through one to the right of where I am. So I have to do length plus one included. Mm -hmm. 
So same, give me X minus the length plus my Y and Y going one up, saturating it to zero again. Then do the same, but Y plus one. If I go outside of my schema, I will find nothing there. So cool, it's fine. And I have a test down here covering this. So starting from a number in choose zero with length two, I have this vector of coordinates. Starting from something in four, four, and this with, with a width of two, I have this vector of coordinates. That is one, four, or four, one, three, one, five, two, three, two, five, three, 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 five, four, three, four, five. So I do all the rectangle around my number. And if, the number touch anything around it, it means that uh, I have to count it. I count it and I get the result. Instead, part two was similar, but a little bit different. Part two says that I have only to consider the one that are gears. So I get my gears as a Nash set of coordinates. So gear is again a Nash set of U size, U size. Mm -hmm. But uh, I filter map instead of just uh, uh, mapping because I, only, I have to take only the one that are stars, that are uh, yep. years. So I return some coordinate, otherwise I return known. And uh, this way I have the same gear, um, the same type that is a Nash set of coordinates. And again, I parse number and symbols into numbers and symbols. Then I keep a mutable hash map of my ratios that are identified by a coordinate, where is the ratio, and uh, a tuple of two integers. Now, the first integer is the ratio itself. The second integer is how many uh, numbers were around that gear, because we mm -hmm. remember that we only have to take the one with two gears around the number. Yeah. So I start for every number, is the number touching a gear? Is the number touching a gear? Yes. Okay. Give me the ratio for that gear, if you have one. If you don't have one, I add the coordinate, I'm at the number, and one. That means this is this gear is touching one, mm -hmm. uh, one number. If I was in, if I go into the if, it means that. Uh, I already found a previous gear that is uh, touching the number. If uh, the gear, if the previous number of gears is one, okay, at this point I update uh, computing the count and saying that I'm touching two gears. Otherwise, uh, it means that I already have a two there. The two becomes a three and I don't care about it anymore. So even if it touch four, five, six, seven gears, I don't care about uh, doing math around it. It's not something that I should consider. And I put a zero as the ratio, and I say this is touched by three gears. In my okay. first implementation, I was just putting the zero, but I was not considering this scenario where uh, there was only one number touching the gear. Mm -hmm. So for this reason, I was saying, okay, if I touch three gears, I put a zero. So when I sum down here, I will sum at zero and it will not change my result. But I forgot to consider the, the edge case when it's touching only one gear. So I had to introduce the number of touched gears to get rid of this edge case. I, I did it I, the other way around. I did iterate over the gears and ah, okay. then figure out which parts numbers. were adjacent to the gears. And then, yeah, I'm, I'll show in a bit, but. I think yeah, it's the same it's idea. Start. I just, I just assume that the cardinality of gears is smaller than the one of the numbers, but I, I didn't even check. That, that is, so. but uh, yeah, in the end, uh, I don't think it's a lot of difference. Then the, my final number is the ratios. I only take the one, filter only the one that have two gears. And uh, I take out the first element of this tuple and I sum all together. Mm -hmm. Probably I could have done this with a filter map, to be honest. Yeah, I could have done this with a filter right, map. Right, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah okay. I, I'm seeing that now. But, but here is readable the, enough that should be okay. Yeah, but at the beginning, it was just a, was just a ratio value a sum. 
mm-hmm. with Eva was failing. Then I had to make it work. So yeah, he, he, yes, it's not uh, super clean. Then I have my tests here. I have also test for the parsing of the readme input that are a little bit verbose because long. And then I have, uh, I also tested some custom uh, implementation just to be, mm -hmm. to be sure of what I was doing. So yeah, part one, part two, and uh, this is my part one output and this is my part two output. So you say that you work it the other way around. Yes, let me show you. So I also did something similar in terms of parsing. I the neighbor stuff, I did it kind of this way, but let's go in order. So I call it part, what you call number, but the struct is exactly the same. Like you have an ID, you have the coordinates, you have the length. I call symbol what you call symbol and it's literally the same. I just use a char. And then I have a schematic, which is like the, the map itself. What I'm doing, I am pre-indexing everything that I think I'm going to need. So when I create a schematic, I will have the list with all the parts, an index part by position. So I can look up, is there a part in that particular position? And by the way, here I use an interesting trick to avoid duplications or to have to do direct references. This U sides is the position of the part in this vector. Ah, okay. So this is basically a way to say all the parts, they are owned by the schematic in this list of parts is going to be mutable. So you can just reference with an ID. Instead, if you use a reference to a part, then sometimes depending on how you create that part, you have like, this part was moved, yeah. so you cannot use it anymore, or this reference is not going to last long enough, that kind of stuff. And then I have a hash set of symbols. So all the possible symbols that I found in an hash set and all the gears that I found in an hash set just for convenience. So then in the schematic implementation, I have helper methods like get part by position. So this effectively resolved this reference into an actual part reference mm -hmm. and then get neighbor parts. It makes sure to checks all the neighbors of this particular cell. And if there are parts, they will be added in an hash set. And the reason why you, I'm using the hash set is because you can be multiple time names, neighbors of the same part. So that way I'm basically removing duplicates. Yeah. And then I created this schematic parser, which the reason why I did this is just to remove some code duplication because there were, I think in your code, you had a bunch of places where it was like, Okay, if I'm getting here, then I need to flush whatever is the current buffer of the number. Mm -hmm. And that happens in multiple places in, yeah. in the parsing logic. So by doing a dedicated struct, I can kind of isolate all of that into a method. And then every time I want to flush, ah, I okay. just call that method, uh, which is basically this method here, add a new part. So basically what I do here, I start with an empty schematic that doesn't have anything. In fact, my schematic implements default, which is going to give you an empty vector, an empty hash map, an empty hash set, an empty hash set. And then what I do, I have a buffer, num buffer, which initially is an empty string. And then num buffer starts at X, which is a U sides. So that's basically the first position where we saw the current number. So I know exactly like what is the X position of that instance of the part. So here, uh, let's ignore this one for a second. The parse is probably more interesting. So this is not too different from what you did. It's just structured slightly different, but I'm parsing every line and every character per line. So we have an X and Y. And basically what I'm doing is, um, so at the beginning of a line, if the last thing you had in the previous line was a number, you need to flush. Ah, okay. That that, uh, but what if he, a number is in the bottom right? Oh yeah, good question. I think that's a bug that I maybe I but didn't well, have that. Probably you didn't add that number in the bottom right, so it was fine. Good catch, though. Yeah, I think I need to do because that. I'm doing the same check, but after the row, not uh, at the beginning of uh, the new row. So so basically, if I just move this at the end of the loop. 
yeah, probably she is enough to put that after the 4x loop. If okay. you still have something in the buffer, flush it. Good point. Okay. So that's a good suggestion, and we have tests to see it if we broke if, something. Uh, I broke everything here. <laughs> so basically, here I'm doing a match. So it's the same thing you ah, did, but okay. just a little bit more, I don't know, idiomatic. Yeah, so probably. if it is a number, you need to increase the buffer. And if the buffer was initially empty, make sure you also store that this is the point where the number is starting. And then... I said that I'm not storing the X because I'm storing the coordinate when you run out of the number. But And then all my logic is shifted by that. Mm, okay, okay. Yeah, I guess it works either way. Just somehow yeah. I thought about it this way. Then when it's a dot, you basically, you don't have to do anything except if you have something in the buffer, you have to add a new part. So whatever you buffer so far needs to be a part that is created. And then when you find a symbol, again, if you have something in the buffer, it means you finish to see a number and you need to transform that number into a part. But also you need to add the current symbol. So I have another helper method to create a symbol. And then finally, then I reset that we just moved. And then at the end, you can retard the schematic. Now, another interesting thing is that the parse method takes a mutable self, not a reference. So you can only parse once. So you create a parser, you parse, and then you cannot reuse the, that parser. This is just, I mean, we don't really need to do this in the exercise, but it's just an implementation detail that it is interesting just to avoid myself to create clean up logic at the beginning of a parse. Because th this kind of guarantees that every time you parse, you have a new fresh instance where all the mm, wow, okay. values are already cleaned up. Otherwise, I guess here you will need to do empty the buffer, empty the list, empty the asset, all that kind of stuff, which here we don't need to do. And then you can just return the self schematic and it's going to be moved out of the current structure, which is going to be disposed anyway. Okay, then uh, I guess add the new part and add the new symbol. The only interesting things here is that I'm also updating when I add a new part. I'm also going to update all the indices. So for instance, here, I'm going to create an entry here in the parts by position. And I also going to add the part here. And then here I do something similar. So I create a new symbol and the symbol is just the character in the coordinates. But I also do, if the character is an asterisk, I'm going to index it as a gear as well. And in this case, I'm just cloning it because I don't think that happens too often. And then I also insert it as a symbol. So for part one, it's very simple. What we do is create the parser and parse, and you get a schematic. Then take all the symbols, iterate over them, do a flat map, and then basically I'm saying get all the neighboring parts and flat map them. So I'm basically I'm getting mm -hmm. all the parts that add a symbol as an, at least one symbol as a neighbor. And, and you're doing a set out of that to be sure that uh, you don't have duplicates. Uh, I think get neighboring parts already gives me a set. So I think flat okay. map puts everything in a set anyway. Mm, okay, it's keeping the set. Let's, let's check what happens if we stop here, right? Oh, yeah, it's still an iterator. That's interesting. Yeah, I think it's still a set. See, what if we do collect? I think if we do collect, we need to be explicit about what we collect. Okay. Yeah, what you want to collect, yes. I was because a number uh, can be near two parts, uh, two symbols. I don't know if it can. Yeah, I did assume that it's giving me. Uh, sorry, I need to remove this. I did assume that it's still considering it a set because this one gives me an asset. So if you do a flat map of assets, I think it's still an asset, but it works. So it's probably true, but I I, I don't know for sure. So that, that is the solution. Part two, what we need to do is rather than iterating over all the symbols, um, 
you iterate only over the gears we iterate only over the gears which is here we do a filter map because we only want to keep the ones that have two, two parts. neighbors and then in that case what we return is uh, uh, the product of the part ids yes so we are iterating over these two values and do a product. the product otherwise it's none and then we do the sum of all of that values now let's yeah, see if everything it. still works oh we broke some no. what you change it you because we moved the the, that stuff at the end do, so do we need it at the end or at the bottom i remove it move it again on the top uh, then you will look uh, i mean your input is probably fine with that i don't get why it should not work on the bottom in the end i think you might need it in both places because you might have numbers at the end of a line and numbers mm -hmm. at the beginning of a line. Well, so well you if you are at the end of the previous line and you add the part, you flush the accumulator, no? Now that you put that on top, is Yeah, but I, did, I didn't have... Okay, let me... Let's see if Let's it works. It. Yeah, that works. Okay, so I think I need it in both places. Right? let's say the first line let's say the first okay. line at the end you have numbers and at the beginning of the second line you have numbers what happens yeah but when you are out of the loop and you exit and you flush mm -hmm. then you will enter in the new line with the the buffer that is empty you are flashing that buffer when you are when you do add a new part right yes i think so let's double check how we do it yeah there oh Somebody we have the some people in the chat if, uh, we have a regular expression in rust yes but they are painful <laughs> <laughs> yeah and actually they are not really in the language there is an external crate called regex that yeah it's pretty much gives you everything you would expect from uh, uh, i just remember that using them looping uh, through them uh, with borrowing and stuff like that is not uh, the easiest stuff on earth yeah it could be a bit painful but this is the crate if you want to have a look and I don't know if you're asking because you think we could have used regexes here. I'm not I sure. Don't. Maybe I for the parsing, how. but and yeah. how do you keep the coordinates? Exactly. Yeah, you still need to keep the coordinates. So unless you in the matches, you also get the coordinates, but I'm not sure that's no, the I case. Don't think so. So okay. yeah, very similar approach, only that you loop on symbols instead I loop on numbers and they check it. Yeah. Let me make yeah. sure that this is... No, I think when we put it at the end, it breaks for some reason. I don't understand why, but okay. Am I putting it in the wrong place? Wait. Do I need to put it outside the outer loop? Outside the X loop, inside the Y loop. But you That's can put that idea. outside of you can put that outside of the y because you are doing the x one at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, I think that needs to be there anyway. Now it's not that one should work. No, you don't have. Oh y. yeah, I don't have y. Right. But what y? Oh, uh, maybe that's why it breaks because I was doing y minus one. I just ah, need to do at y the end, you, at the end you have to do y. Okay, that makes sense now. And we yeah, can, I think now we to... can remove it from here. Okay. Okay. Sorry, it's late. I'm going to use that excuse. Cool. That now okay. works. And part <laughs> two works as well. Cool. No, yeah, it was the, uh, sorry, I missed the, the minus one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you do that at the end of the row, you are still in that row. You're not in the row before. And this way, even if there's something top, bottom right, you catch it. Okay, yeah. I think for today we can call it a day. What do you think? 
I think so. Yeah. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us. We we'll, let me just post the repos. Can okay, let's share... wrap it up. Can you, you share can... your own repo in the chat or should I do it for you? Uh, do it please because I am uh, looking at the chat through the phone and that okay. could be like a night. <laughs> so I'll put so... Roberto's one first and then my so one. So you get scared and then you look at a proper one. No. Your ones are always amazing. You just don't spend too much time polishing sometimes, but you have the best ideas for solution. So let's wrap it up. You can find the recording on YouTube. Uh, the link is on the Twitch in the about session. If you're watching this on YouTube, we live stream every day, 6 p.m. Dublin time. Make sure to check the Twitch link in the YouTube description. Give us a follow and click on the buttons. Uh, feel free to leave uh, comments, open pull requests. Uh, everything is well accepted. We are trying to learn Rust, so don't expect our solution to be beautiful. Luciano's ones are better. Uh, <laughs> if you know better ways of doing stuff, let us know. Thank you for the people to the people in the chat. And uh, are we raiding somebody, or we are just yes. going to be there straight away? We are doing a raid. We are raiding trash dev, so expect some trash coding. And some oh, trash, trash coding, trash. We should create a language called trash. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See you, everyone. Bye.